right testing one two three and we're getting ready to roll in three two one hey welcome back it's alternative perspectives podcast and today we have clark wills attorney at law we're going to dip into some some controversial stuff and we're going to find out how controversial it is compared to i mean if it's just really the best thing that's happening right now um today we're discussing uh the delay and denial of persons being brought back into Trinidad or citizens being brought back into Trinidad or being allowed to come back into Trinidad and then we're going to touch on some other lighter topics and issues as well um so mr wills welcome Thank thanks you. for being a part yep happy to be here <laughs> So, um, as I was saying earlier on, is the delay and denial for citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to return home right now, is it constitutional? Um, or is there some room, because we're going through a pandemic, for the government to have some, some say? Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the constitution, the written constitution that Trinidad has, generally deals with a person's right to liberty. Now, because it's a pandemic, you have these, I don't know if they would call it emergency legislation, but you have this rushed legislation that has come into effect. And for obvious reasons, travel is probably one of the main offenders when it comes to the spread of the um, COVID. So it's really balancing rights and the interests of those people who have not traveled as opposed to those who have traveled. Mm -hmm. So in the one breath, as a Trinidad citizen or a national, you have the right to travel, especially to cross the borders for your own country. But then in the same, in the same token, at what cost? Because up until recently, it would be fair to say, to my knowledge, I think Trinidad had one alleged homegrown um, account of COVID. The rest were import, imported. Mm. So in order to protect the, the rights of the, um, those of nationals who didn't travel, I would argue that it was and is a necessary evil. But with that said, we have heard of infractions where people have come to Trinidad. Um, I think most notably it was with respect to a Venezuelan contingent, I think, that came to Trinidad and were flown in and flown. So if you're going to bend the rules in that regard, it's difficult to justify how you would stop those who have a bona fide right to be here from coming back. However, I think that one could also argue that there are checks and balances that you could put in place to accommodate people coming in. Mm. So the quarantine system has shown itself to be effective and it is something that is a viable alternative as opposed to just this blanket ban. Is it an infraction of um, infringement of someone's constitutional right? The constitution certainly, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't speak to an individual's right to come to Trinidad and to far fly freely in and out of the country. Even if you're a citizen? Well, one could envisage, look at a, look at a vintage of the um, constitution. I think at that stage, traveling, airpl airplane travel in particular, it was not something that was ubiquitous. You know, not everybody mm -hmm. was in a position to do that. And certainly not everyone was minded to do that. So there is nothing in the constitution that speaks about someone being able to jump on Caribbean airways and fly wherever they are to come back. As I said, well, the fundamental freedoms that we as lawyers generally are focused on, uh, the liberty, the right of someone to have their liberty and in certain circumstances for that liberty to be taken away uh, and or restricted. Are the people who are refused entry denied their liberty? No, they're free. It's mm. not as if they're sitting in jail. It's not as if their movement is restricted in terms of them being able to leave wheresoever they are, whatever residence they may be in. Yep, they may not be afforded an opportunity to come to Trinidad, 
But these are extenuated circumstances. Okay. I think this is the first time in, um, well, in recent history that we have this global pandemic. Now, people, people would say, though, that, and of course, you're not attacking any government or anything like that, um, but people would have been outside there running out of, of finances who might have been staying in a hotel, they're not required to even stay even longer. Um, what position it puts people like that in? Could they apply or could they come back and, and hand in the bill to the government to say, listen, at least help me with half of it or something? The media globally has not looked at the full spectrum in respect of the knock-on effects of the COVID. So far, I think that the biggest hype you had outside of the obvious, the economic, was the stocking up of toilet paper <laughs> and, um, and sanitizer. But the knock-on effects are further reaching than that, clearly. When one looks at the global economy and the effects of the COVID, you have, it's devastated a lot of economies. Um, a lot of companies that have been around for um, generations have uh, no longer exist. You have unemployment figures that are doubling. You have indebtedness that also is um, above acceptable levels given a so-called uh, modern economy. And yes, clearly, if people's, if businesses are shutting down, if the mandate generally is this uh, stay-at-home policy and this, because it's not the social distancing part of it, it's the fact that places, as in whole regions or countries, are shutting down. And companies can't afford to pay people if the company isn't functioning. And I think it's untenable to hold a company to account, especially these um, small family businesses or medium-sized concerns. The length of time that COVID has been in existence now, clearly it's going to have a profound effect on their ability to pay their staff and to keep their companies as a going concern. There has been the approach, especially um, in Trinidad, I, I think it's a, a mixed blessing because the idea is sound that the banks are extending the um, mortgages or yeah, mortgages yeah. People to have this period where they don't have to pay. But my understanding is that it's not an interest-free type of endeavour. So the bank actually isn't really helping mm. you. You know, it's protecting its interest. Mm. It's money secured against your house in any event. Yeah. But for the average person who is not deriving an income, I, I'm certain that there are some, comp some families, rather, in Trinidad, who have been living or were living from paycheck to paycheck. Now, the government has tried to intercede and help, and it's to be expected. The people who are abroad, who bears that responsibility is a legitimate question because most countries will be more concerned with their own nationals mm -hmm. as opposed to foreign nationals. And immigration is a hot topic globally now because you get a lot, a lot of economic migrants and there's a lot of uh, um, countries at the moment that are going through turmoil, war, uh, and that has created mass uh, fluxes, fluxes of um, people migrating, um, some legitimate, some just seizing the opportunity to um, get away. Whereas I accept that you will have those people who just get, happen to be out at the time and the borders shut, they, especially if they weren't visiting relatives, because I accept it would put a strain on the relatives anyway, yeah. but if you went on one of these horizon type holidays and then all of a sudden the borders are closed, one would argue that the people who are responsible for the holiday would have a duty of care and that duty clearly wouldn't stop just because corona is here. It would be a question really for the individual states to intercede. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it could be deemed fitting 
to saddle the government here with a global responsibility for all Trinidad nationals who have been caught out by the COVID because the resources that you would have to employ in order to discern those who are bona fide travelers as opposed to those who would just seek to take advantage of it. Meaning, it could have been someone who was out of the country in any event yeah. and now decides, well, you know what? Trinidad is paying Trinidad nationals to be able to survive the port. So I'm going to say my claim, and I'll swear to an affidavit that mm. I was on my way, I was mm. coming back to Trinidad. So no, I think that it is supposed to be incumbent upon individual governments to look after the people who are within their borders at any uh, material time. Okay, and next question, as you're dealing with uh, like outside people who are outside compared to people who are here, is mandatory quarantine against people's constitutional rights? Well, you see, we started with the Constitution and the rights for someone's liberty. Mm. And in certain circumstances, for them to be denied that liberty. Now, I am almost certain that Trinidad, and to my knowledge, I'm yet to hear of anyone in Trinidad who has been subject to house arrest. So my understanding of the application of the Constitution in Trinidad is that when someone say, denies you your liberty, it's because you're behind bars. You're in prison or you're in a police station in a cell somewhere, but you're not free to leave. In Trinidad, you are, your movement is restricted in as much as this mandatory um, stay at home curfew, if you will, it's not strictly speaking denying you of your liberty. But that's for the ones that are home, but what about people who, who would come back in and, or people who, who, who are tested and they say, okay, you're positive, you have to go into quarantine. The reason I'm asking is because I know of two people in New Jersey who were tested and they went home and they spent their time at home fighting the virus. Um, thank God they, they survived and, and the, their doctor, their, their private doctor, uh, he recommended or um, prescribed, sorry, he prescribed the necessary medication, um, which was just like Ventolin and whatnot. And, and they, they went through that period at home. They went through the, the entire um, process of recovering from COVID at home. So, and I'm not saying, I know am I saying that people should do that. People should be able to, to do it at home. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is it that that could be an option, but it was just not offered to, to the people. I think it's, there's a utilitarianism mm. where you look at the good of the greater, you know, the greater good. Yeah. If you decide that you're not, you're going to move away from this forced isolation for those people who have just come into the country, this 14 day quarantine period, and you're going to move away from that and as such people who may have it who come into the country you're just going to encourage them or even dictate that they self-quarantine there's two things that arise out of that the first is what of those people who decide in their infinite wisdom that they're not going to that they've just come back They've missed liming with mm -hmm. the boys. Mm -hmm. So they're either going to invite everybody around or they're going to go out. What do you do for those people? And I mean, as I say, I agree because obviously if there's a possibility that you can have it, obviously um, coming from places where it's rampant, there's a high possibility that, you know, um, now some people might say, no, I, I would secure myself but they don't want to be locked down or at your mercy because it better it be, they don't want to eat the food you just cook because they don't like, you understand? They don't like what all they're providing. They, I like my roti a particular way. Yeah. You understand? They, they go to plenty of pepper, yeah. right? I'm going to pat Raj from high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and the second point is, how do you police it? Right. 
even if you decide, right, well, we're not going to have quarantine centers. We're just going to tell people that um, it is a mandatory quarantine period. So we'll deal strictly with those people who are coming in. So it's going to be a mandatory quarantine period. You are to go home and quarantine yourself. What happens when a person decides they're not going to do it? How do you police it? Well, you're going to post a policeman outside in exactly. the door front and mm. back. Well, you're going to set up cameras. The type of resources you'll need just for that. Because if that person, um, I think it was, is it South Korea, where they talk about patient 31 or 32? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How many people were infected from that, from that one, one person? person. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to look at. You see, Trinidad, Trinidad is a place that has um, clumps of people, clusters of people. And then you have rural areas. But because of the, I don't know if the word would be culture, but because of the practices of the people, they're accustomed, this fetting culture, this liming culture. You have a high levels of transits where people come in and going. If, that, if one person decides they're going to sit down in their local bar, because we've seen how it works. Um, you look at the police, for example. Depending on who is meeting, they will find themselves with the police storming the place and arresting everybody because it's a breach of the COVID. But so other sections of society are not subject mm. to such stringent measures by our fine upstanding law enforcement officers. The point being, you only need one person to be infected in any environment that the police have decided that it's not meritorious for them to raid or stop. And they'll infect however many people there, who will then go and infect however many mm. other people. It's the type of endeavor where sometimes you have to take measures which on their face may seem draconian. But we're looking at a virus where some argue that it's man-made, man some argue that it's natural, some argue that you can get it once and then you have the um, antibody and you're fine. But science is now saying, well, actually, we don't know about that. We're at a stage now where science is saying that we actually can't say how many people have had it, got over it, got it again. We don't know. Because it's become a political football. And when these science and politics come together, the science always suffers. It always sucks. Yeah, and that, which takes me to my next point. I think we are seeing that in the United States right now, where once other people say one thing because it aligns with their political agenda and the next they're seeing something else. Do you want to bring it to Trinidad and his son killing what and his son? I do not want to bring it to that. But well, well, I'm right. glad you didn't because but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but as I say, because and then we had like remember in the early in England, they were trying to lean more to the herd immunity, trying to use the herd, Im herd immunity to, to cure the virus. England was one of the countries that was hit hard by it. At the time when it came out, I remember I was in two minds as to whether to go on weather the storm in England or to stay in Trinidad. Now, the media doesn't give you the full picture. So I would speak to my brothers and they said to me, don't come. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't come. And then the death toll in England is terrible. Absolutely terrible. And that is one of the leading first world countries. It's part of the G8 or G7 or G6 now even. And look what it did there. And they have state of the art, cutting edge um, medicines, uh, the technology, the equipment. So no, no, when you look at the approaches that have been adopted and to be adopted, I am apolitical. I have no real political affiliations or allegiances. But you would have to, whether you like the government or not, their approach thus far has saved lives. This, we're at a stage where any vaccine 
will take realistically, if you rush it, maybe three years, and that's at a real stretch. But on average, around five years, five, sometimes you know, seven years. And the virus that we look at, we understand that it is a um, single strand as opposed to a double strand, which makes it unstable, so it just keeps morphing. With that said, prevention is definitely better than cure. It's something that kills people. And despite what was rumored before, remember, people of Afro-Caribbean descent mm -hmm. were... No. It only kills the very old... Uh, you see, they have this new strain affecting toddlers now. So from the very old to the very young, it's indiscriminate. No. And yes, and as much as we understand that, my major question still is, is it that because it's a pandemic and because of what it is, um, your constitutional rights or our constitutional rights could be put on the back burner a bit to facilitate these things? I don't think that they are. I don't think the constitutional rights of the individual have been suspended at all. I think it's incumbent. Remember, what is the constitution? Mm. Constitution is a set of rules, a set of guidelines right. that are in place so that whomsoever is governing the people, they have rules that restrict and control what they can mm. or cannot do. The Constitution is supposed to stop tyranny. Now, one can always argue whether or not it's effectively achieved that or not, <laughs> and, and that's a separate point. But if the Constitution is supposed to be a moral guide, then is it not morally incumbent upon whomsoever is in charge to protect the masses? Right, yes, I agree. And I... in so doing, you have something, a virus, that is global, indiscriminate. We know that it lives in hot climates and cold climates. It has a, when I say shelf life, that is to say that it can live on inanimate objects for up to however many hours, depending on the object. What right-minded government given its communicability, would think it proper to allow people who may be infected, not dealing with the infected, people who may be infected, to be able to freely move amongst the population. All right, I, I agree. I totally agree with you. I think what they're doing is the best thing. The Constitution does not give someone the right to present a real risk of harm, injury, or death to other people. So one cannot, in my respectful view, one cannot argue that it is an infringement or infraction of my constitutional rights to be able to jump on a plane, come to Trinidad, so I can leave somewhere like England, where it's rampant, Spain, rampant. So I'm going to come from Venezuela, where I come from a country, Brazil, people are dropping dead in their hundreds. And I must be able to stand behind the constitution and say that it is my constitutional right to fly to Trinidad and walk freely. I'm okay, but Trinidad. even if not walk freely, even if they are, they are agreeing to go into to the quarantine. Now, let me take you back a few, a few months ago. A few months ago, there was a point in time where the facilities we had here were basically empty, yeah. right? Um, and people still weren't coming in like they are coming in now, yeah. right? Can people, can people say that, yo, I think you left me outside unjustifiably? No, because it's where we are, it's well established that the scientists, they actually don't have a full and comprehensive understanding of the virus and, what, and, and what's really going on. We know it's communicable. Um, we know that, for example, look at the masks. We're looking at a virus, not a bacteria. A virus is significantly smaller than a bacteria. That mask isn't going to stop a virus. It doesn't stop a virus. But what it will do is if you decide with your COVID self to run out there and sneeze down the place, it's going to catch the droplets. So it's going to stop you 
from putting your droplets or making your droplets airborne and infecting other people. But we also know that if you wear a mask continuously, it starts to affect, was it the um, carbon monoxide, which has a knock-on effect with your immune system and leaves you open, prone mm. to sickness. So it's about a sensible approach. If, and again, using the same mask. So that if you know that the object of the mask is to stop you from sneezing down the place and infecting people, then when you are in a environment where people are clear close by or nearby, it makes sense to wear your mask. Mm. But then if you're going to be outside where there's loads of space, people not really close to one another, do you really need to wear your mask then? Which leads to the next question, because you're seeing certain states in the United States. Where they're trying to make it mandatory. Where it, where? Yeah. Because I think that, I don't know if you could really look at America as a good case. <laughs> I've got to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> because... In America, what you're seeing is different strokes for different folks, and for obvious mm. reasons. So we needn't really trouble ourselves mm. with that. If we look at the Trinidad model, where there seems to be a, more, a, a cohesive government, what they try to do, in my view, is roll out policies that are consistent with the reliable information. And, re and what makes it reliable is as they see it because what's reliable today may not be reliable tomorrow. Mm. But they're looking at the information as it presents itself and trying to put in place practical and effective policies. Because I'm certain that not every policy is uh, practical. So you have to look at practicality as well as effectiveness. Because the underlying objective must always be the preservation of life and the safety of your citizens. And you cannot, you know, the good thing, if I may, the good thing about the COVID, if there is such a good thing, is it's no respecter of persons. So what's good for one is good for all. So it's not, it straddles the classes, ethnicity, religion, you name it. So the policies that you do get will be well thought out because those individuals who have the privileged position in terms of the higher echelons of society, they're provisions that are going to have to affect them as well. No, but people might tell you when there were limited people coming into the country um, and they claim that they, they turn on somebody's um, application, but then they tell the person, listen, if you could pass in the Bahamas and pick up this woman, yeah, you could come on. It's not a scene. You, you'll get a reply if you could, you know? I mean, but then, yeah. so, so people think about how people feel yeah. now, like, so this is, a, if I had a plane, I could pass, pass and make a trip and pick up something, but I could come home, I, I don't know. No, what do you say? <laughs> don't, you, I'll tell you, really don't want to open that can of words. <laughs> I've tried, to, I've tried to answer your questions <laughs> in a way that really is more a straddling the middle line in terms of generalization <laughs> as opposed to looking at the inherent flaws in Trinidad with respect and regard to those people who are charged with the responsibility of making decisions. Hold on one second. Let's do it. All right. Just, yeah. So yeah, let's continue. Sorry about that. Because in an ideal situation, what's good for one is good for all. Sadly. And again, I, I am not <laughs> going to be drawn. I will just simply say <laughs> that we know for whatever reason, again, I'm not going to be drawn, there are exceptions. No matter how unpalatable or palatable, there are exceptions. And I agree. But my thing is, so the people who are outside, when they see exceptions like these, they might think, well, listen, I might have some legal grounds because 
because they, because obviously they have to question well based on what based on what you know this exception came in that i can you can't make that same exception for me one of the grounds that the court will look at when assessing um, constitutional endeavors administration administrative law is what they call the floodgates theory and that is if you do or give this ruling will it open the floodgates and clearly that will it will it would give however many hundreds or however many thousands however many people it will give them a legitimate claim so i'm of the view that when the court assesses the constitutional rights of the individual the state of affairs what the government is actually hoping to achieve what the government has achieved looking around globally at other countries and those few people who were exempted or a blind eye was turned to or even who were encouraged I don't think the court is going to say that because you allowed these handful of people then that all of these other people have a legitimate claim and can sue the, sue the government because at no stage in my view, will you be able to establish that the person actually suffered a harm within the confines of the law that is actionable? Okay. Okay. I mean, good luck to those who are oh, there still. I mean, best wishes and we hope no, everything I'm works out soon. I'm not saying it's right. Don't mm. get me wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that the government has a very strong arguable case as to why they're out. And for an individual who is out there, I don't think the government could ever present an argument that could justify some people being exempted <laughs> while they are left out in the wings. And as I was saying, um, I think my, my, the only place or the only contention I have now, I understand now they could only bring in, as a certain, bring in a certain amount so that they don't uh, overwhelm our system, our healthcare system, which is totally understandable and I'm cool with that. What I'm saying there's a period of time when all the facilities were empty. Yes. We ended up with nobody and people weren't coming in. Now, if, in my opinion, if we started bringing people back in earlier, I, I don't think we would have ended up with this big backlog now. You say that, but at that time, you were watching healthcare systems globally failing. You heard this expression everywhere. Every time you turn on the radio or the television, flattening the curve. You could not have predicted that as the COVID picked up globally, that you would not have found yourself in the same predicament. So you're on the side of caution. What would you do? Would you say, you know what? Let's suck it and see. No, it, there was, I'm trying to remember which... Prime Minister, it was, I think, a, f a female Prime Minister from one, probably one of the European countries. And, and she came out and admitted that she operated out of fear with a lot of the things that she put in place. Yeah. Um, and she just kind of apologized. And if you want to put it like that, like, I know, you know, a lot of you all, was, a lot of you all were displaced and whatnot, but I operated out of fear, basically, right? Um, that's kind of the situation that might kind of end up because as I said you see the point of time when we had no people in, nobody in or even if you have bring back 10 at a time 10 for 14 days see how it goes and then bring back then bring 10 again because as I said these people who, who are out there as much as you're saying right that you see what's going on in what they being in New York you being in Florida you're like gee this thing is it's getting worse here I want to be home. I want I, to be. I don't need to laugh, right? But uh, I can see. I can, could you imagine? Because you're in a lion's den. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Trinidad, by all accounts, is being untouched by it. Exactly. And they won't let you in. Trinidad. And you're like, I just don't know what. Yeah, it seems wrong on its face. <laughs> but let me ask you this: If you were charged with the responsibility of making those decisions. And you're watching a place like America, you're looking at England, you're looking at Spain, you're looking at 
so-called first world countries. From, and if you, if you, you also recall that we, it didn't start off like that with them. It was drip, drip, drip. Mm -hmm. And then it just galloped. It just fell away from them. You in Trinidad watching this play out, you watch it unfold. What makes you think that it's not going to happen to you? What was there at that time, globally, that was suggested? Because no one expected it to be the way it was in England, or America, or Spain. It just unfolded. You looked at China, because at that stage people were watching China, especially in the Wuhan where it started. People walking down the street dropping dead, and it was terrible, absolutely terrible. And it seemed as if it was just unabated, just on. And then you were hearing the soothsayers saying that however many people would die and that it would be, what, I think it's 80% of people would get it. And you're sitting down with your country to run. You're hearing this, you're seeing this, and you're not going to think to yourself, well, you know what? That's not going to happen to us. We, and it's not going to happen to us because guess what? We're going to do things differently. We looked at China and what China did, the first thing China did when it started to get out of hand was lock down everything. I'm certain you remember the media at the mm -hmm. time when China shut down everything. That's unheard of. Yeah. You know, all the businesses shut down, the borders shut down. Now, China shut down its borders initially, I think because the other countries were saying, listen, we don't want no Chinese in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see what's happening in China? We don't want that here. China shut down its borders, it shut down all its businesses, people are on this quarantine, this forced quarantine at home, and you can go to like a ghost town. And then it just abated. Within however many months, China's economy started picking up, and wherever it got a little splatter, just shut down. That was its approach. You're on the outside looking in, and you see that. You're gonna tell yourself, well, you know what? It may be using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but it's working because their economy is now probably the only economy that's not in recession. They have uh, um, adapted their, not just the economy, but their whole socio-economic, everything is now corona-friendly, so to speak, because they adapted. So when you're on the outside looking in and you see what works, why wouldn't you do that? You look at those countries that tried to not do it in as much as these half measures, Spain, for example, look at Italy. You look at Brazil, mm -hmm. yeah. who are not doing it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, for the love of God, would you think that that's the way to go? Well, so, yeah, mm -hmm. you have your institutions that are empty, but at that time, you could not know that you would not have suffered the same fate of those other countries that didn't shut down. You I mean, that, that's a perfect way to look at it. And as I said, it's a discussion. I mean, I, I would applaud the government for the way they handled the shutdown, the timing, everything. Um, you know, I make a joke when I said that, when I say that Trinidad and Tobago government, at a point, they say, okay, we're not taking people from China, right? And we're okay with that. All of us were okay with it. And Trump said the same thing. They call him a racist, but he is a racist. So, <laughs> <laughs> but he call a spade a spade. But if, if you look, for example, now, my understanding is the most recent um, outbreak that we have is supposed to be attributed to people coming from Venezuela. So again, it's imported, but it's here now. Mm. If your failure to make your borders secure, you now have it back, and which. And now you're telling me that, well, you know, your, 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 your um, establishment's are empty, so why not bring them back? Well, you, I'll tell you why not. <laughs> Look and see what's happening now. Well, the thing is, I have been seeing this, and as I say once again, I do want, because you know people just get touchy feel and talk anything in politics, right? And, I mean, honestly, I don't vote because I don't believe my vote actually counts here. That's a, a next debate. We are not going to discuss yeah. that because ultimately, if you are happy sitting in the uh, margins, then sit in the margins. I tell anyone, mm -hmm. you know, and because I, I will, talk, I will tell you about that as we're having a nice light conversation. Mm -hmm. Margins are simple for you. 
if you're not going to throw your hat in the ring, then don't complain. I agree. Yep, don't complain. And that suits you well because you wore, yours is more of a, and I must say this because it, it, uh, it uh, pleases me to be able to say it, it's more of a independent, yes, yeah, more of an independent journalistic approach. So you're not making any judgments. You're just giving people the facts. Let them make the judgments. Yeah. So yes, why should you vote? Exactly. For, for me... Yeah. Why should you vote? Exactly. Because no one can sit down and say that you have any political allegiance or any political affiliation. You will criticise each party on their merits. Exactly. And so my issue, it, it, it has been for a while, the borders needed to be policed better a while now. Right? I mean, especially when we saw how they were, how they were coming in droves last June. Right? So, wasn't it Manning that brought in those special boats in order to do just that? Well, he wanted, he, he, he ordered them, yeah. and then the last party came and cancelled them, and then they said they were going to bring something else, and they did end up buying some stuff, um, which eventually came, and then the current administration, which is uh, Dr. Rowley's administration, they bought some things to assist as well. But I think um, a problem we have in Trinidad and Tobago is maintenance. I think we do things, but we have a, we have a bad problem with follow-up. I said that when I first came here, that what Trinidad lacks is maintenance. If they were to adopt a more consistent, and it not because it just can't be consistent. It has to also because everything, even in the law in Trinidad, everything is this ad hoc type of endeavour. You take you start off with the Commonwealth in as much as most of your legislation is English. Mm. Then at some stage, for some strange reason, you feel the need to start taking pieces of legislation from places like I think Australia and New Zealand, and uh, and how does that work? Because you see in English. The law has developed over however many centuries, and some of it, you know, common law, some of it's been codified, but you've had the benefit of seeing the law in motion and you're changing it bit by bit in order to adapt to society's needs and those pieces of legislation which have shown themselves to be ineffectual or to have the wrong effect that you, that you mm, desired. Yeah. So then, why would Trinidad feel? that it could pick up swathes of leg legislation from different countries that, um, in my view, not necessarily compatible with the legislation, the bulk of your legislation, or indeed your ability to properly implement it and apply it. It makes <laughs> no sense. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think we may need uh, uh, some sort of legislature, le legislative um, tweaking going on in the country. Um, so then I see... You haven't seen the statutes in England, in Trinidad, sorry, have you? No, no, no. Trinidad has more laws than it needs. Mm. And right now, the problem in Trinidad is not the law. The problem is not the law. Okay. We will look, for example, at recent amendments. In particular, the Bail Act. Now, we've had a few of those, um, some with sunset clauses, meaning that they're just, it's a live piece of legislation for a while, and then it comes off the books. Um, and, and I really don't need to go much further than that. But the point is, in certain circumstances, you're trying to say that some people are not entitled to bail because of either previous convictions and or pending matters and in particular at this stage of the proceedings the type of offence that you come before the court with. Now the one thing about that that ought reasonably to jump out at any objective thinking reasonable person. Now clearly those people are far and few between because you very rarely hear any criticism so I'd like to think that year one, what happens 
when you meet a police officer who is not professional, and that's a polite way of putting it, and he has you in his crosshairs and decides that he's going to give you one of these cases and you are automatically barred from bail. I was of the view, the same constitution that ensures your rights to have your liberty, this whole notion that you're guilty, sorry, I haven't said guilty until proven mm. innocent, and I will tell mm. you why I said that mm. off camera, <laughs> but you're innocent until proven guilty, but you literally have set 120 days, which is a little jail term, before you can go to the judge to petition the High Court for bail. At what stage is that acknowledging your right under the Constitution and this presumption of innocence? Now, as much as I understand exactly what you're saying, I think there are people who would agree, average people you're talking about, right? The man on the street. Because, I mean, obviously, they would think that if the police will be guilty, yep. they would not think that, that no. you know, they, they wouldn't no. think, well, no, the policeman probably setting this man up or whatever it might be, possibly, you understand? Or the, the policeman and, uh, you know, whatever. Do you know how many people that I have met in my tenure here in Trinidad who had that same notion until they have been exposed to the criminal justice system? And each and every one of them at some stage would display varying degrees of shock, disbelief and outrage when they see what really happens in the criminal justice system. You saw recently, and that's to tell you how bad it is, as I digress, you saw a video clipping of three men getting shot to death by the police. And what you clearly see before the shooting starts is one man standing outside the car with his arms up and the driver of the vehicle with his hands out, the you know, his arms up. One out the window and one mm -hmm. you see that. And then seemingly without any form of provocation, gunshots and the three men are dead. You have Alexander speaking on the news and on his show and you know I know the man well and you have the illustrious commissioner speaking in the face of video evidence Listen to what they have to say in defense of the police service or those events. And I guarantee you this, if the shoe were on the other foot, that is to say, if you saw the police officers being mobbed, for example, by an angry crowd, and you see the police officers doing something you know, nothing wrong, just mind your own sweet business. And then the angry mob just sets upon them. You're not going to ask the question that, no, let's have our investigation. Mm. Let's see what really happened. Because you didn't see any firearms. You didn't. So even if one man was shot dead, and that's to say the man in the back of the car, where's the justification for the two other men being killed? But you see, it started before then. Because the commissioner came with this shoot to kill. I take that back. It wasn't shoot to kill. One shot, one kill? One shot, one kill. Now, because I'm almost certain that when they muted the expression shoot to kill, the illustrious commissioner said it's not shoot to kill. But I don't know what one shot, one kill means. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> You then started getting cases where three and four and five people were being killed and one or two guns were being found. So unless these, those, these individuals were playing hot potato with the gun, where's the justifi justification 
for killing more people than weapons. Yeah. But Joe Public, they didn't have anything to say there. Well, I think the reason for that is because people people are generally living in fear. So once they categorize a certain okay. set of people as criminals or they categorize a certain yep. set of people as, as, as threats to society, people will, hey, well, boy, if the police kill them, yeah. you know, kill there's them some... All. Right, so people have a, 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 sigh, yep. a sigh of relief yep. when it happens. Now, I mean, obviously, that didn't start from nowhere, that started from obviously crime being out of control. And I'm not saying it's right in any way, but crime being out of control and people living in fear. So people are like, well, boy, no, obviously, when it reaches on your door or somebody in your family end up in that position and get shot and didn't have a gun or don't even know how to operate a gun, never hold a gun or whatever the case may be, then you be like, oh, this is really going on. No, but how do you bridge that? Or how do you? How do you get people to understand that? No, that that should not be the way in which things should be done. Um, how, how do you get the average person who's in fear, who's living in fear, and, the, and it is painted to them that those people are the criminals? How, how do you get them to understand that? Who has the responsibility with the media and controlling the narrative? Because people would only believe it's acceptable what's taking place if at some stage that message has been seeping down mm -hmm. where it has become it's it become desensitized mm -hmm. so it becomes okay i believe in the sanctity of life i don't believe in violence i don't believe in weapons of violence trinidad seems to be developing this gun culture but then you ask yourself this if joe public thinks that it's okay, what of those young men who by virtue of their postcode, because that's the way it works in Trinidad, people don't look at the individual. Individuality has gone. You're now classifying groups of people and they talk about ghetto this, ghetto that, as if every single person in or from a ghetto is a criminal and society would be better off and safer if they were gone. Where did that narrative come from? When did it become okay? Because I'm certain a lot of the people you refer to who think that you know they've had enough and they're living in fear and if the police are killing them then they must have been guilty. A lot of those people are in their churches on a Sunday beating that Bible, singing those hymns. So-called God-fearing people but yet that's their mindset. That's the way they are. I don't condone it. I don't sanction it. And I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right for those people who are charged with responsibility to protect and serve to be summarily killing people, these extrajudicial killings, and for it to be literally implemented, rubber stamped, or covered up by those people whose job it is to ensure that it doesn't happen. You know, now it's not for me to mention the commissioner of police, but you have to look at what has happened since he has been in office. Um, so you, you, you no, I, I honestly wouldn't have been checking these statistics to see if there were more police shootings. I think they said in... it's over 80% fatalities increased okay. since his tenure. I think since this, was it the beginning of this year? It was all over the press. And that was, um, they started muting those st um, statistics with a recent spate of killings, especially those three chaps that were killed yeah. um, in that teeter. So, the facts speak for themselves. I don't believe in um, statistics at all. Okay. I, I have an engineering background before I um, ventured into law. Uh, mechanical engineering and I know how easily statistics can be massaged and manipulated so I look at the facts and when you look at the facts it's just a body count really mm -hmm. and when you have interactions with the police you ever been stopped by the police yes yes um, and <laughs> how professional were they when they treated you um, most situations I would say 60% of the time they weren't professional. Um, I, it, that has been my experience. I, I would admit. More often than not. Yes. They're not. 
I would admit though, um, right before, no, actually late, late last year, right? I went to a police station to get one of the certificates of good character or whatever done. And in the station was the most professional treatment I've ever seen in my life. I would admit that. Which station? Um, Aruka station. Let me tell you something. It was probably a slim, dark chap there. A very, very nice man. He is the consummate policeman. And I recall, I met the man recently, I recall having to comment on what a pleasant experience it was. But isn't that something? I'm in and out of the police station <laughs> regularly. And there are, for me to have to comment on someone actually being professional at their job, that should be the benchmark. That should be the starting point. Well, to be, and let me it be, shouldn't be the exception. I, I understand, but to be fair, to be quite fair, uh, Mr. Wills, I think the country we live in, I think we need to pressure set in this country. Reason being, a lot of the people who join the police service in this country, they join the police service because it's a job. They join the police service because it's a short salary, um, possibly short pension. Plenty of them, plenty of them don't get into it because they don't get into it because they thinking that I want to serve my country, I want to serve my people, I want to serve and protect. So because I think that is one of the things they forget service, you know, in their motto, it's protect and serve, but they forget the service part of it. And I mean, if you get and I, I always say customer service is not a problem in Trinidad. Let me tell, let me tell you why. There's no custom service in Trinidad. R right. right. It's, I, the problem is the, I think the problem is the people. In terms of, like, you could sit on a train in any one of those major countries or major cities and people will stare in your face, not till a good morning, not till like a good evening or whatever. And an hour after, you could walk in a store and see this person working and that person, Hi, how is your day? Is there anything I could help you with? Because when they reach into position, they know, listen, this is what I need to do. Now, for whatever reason, we as a people, we, we, we aren't able to switch. So the person we are at home, we come and bring that same bad behavior. But if you are police, you bring it to the police station, we bring it to, because I'm a police drag me out of a car time. At our exit, 20 inch rims, and they drag me out of a nice car. car. Yeah, well, it's a nice car when you change the engine. Now, that Renaissance is um, rotary, waste of time. But we're not going to agree, but go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and, and because the car, how the car looked, they, you know, they drive me with the car, you have to be in drugs for, for having this car. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Where did that come from? Right? Imagine you know, that. Whoa, 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 you understand? I have had, since I was 18 years old, I've had proper jobs and working, paying taxes or whatever the case may be. And nice cars. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, and as I say, so I understand where, you know, the interaction with the police plenty of times could be um, a kind of not the best. But it, it still doesn't take away from the fact that we have a problem in our society where people feel unsafe. And so they kind of give it, you're going on, they say to the police, all they do as well, may, if this would make me feel Giving them carte blanche is not a healthy way forward. It is a recipe for disaster. And you are watching the disaster unfold and the vast majority of society are complicit. And when you put yourself in a basket on your way to hell, you can't complain when you get burned. <laughs> I, I understand and I agree. No, the thing is, I think what it, what it might take the people need to see other measures working in calming crime or, or reducing crime in order for them not to accept that though. It's not... The picture, to me, it's... I think for some people they will argue it's complicated. For me it's not complicated. The key to success is you have to deal with the corruption, and it's always 
education. Education, education, education. Because I can't change the way you are. I can't change the way you think. But if I educate you, you can do that for yourself. And when you do that, the effect that you have on the people who you interact with will be different. And if you educate people, you will educate them into banking, in my view, because there is no excuse for ignorance, not in this day and age, not with the mm. internet, because you can fact check anything. Mm. So the days for being able to be deceived or duped or fooled are gone. Instead of people wasting their time on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, if they take the time to look for the information, the facts, it's out there. It's all out there. You educate people, people will want better for themselves. And if they want better for themselves, they are not, they will raise their standard. And in raising your standard, you'll want better for your children, for your children's children, you know, for your brothers, for your sister. You'll want better for the people around you whom you care and love. To think that the answer to Trinidad's ills rests, rests or vests in violence, some savage, because you have a militia now, because that's what it is. You have these officers out there in these um, fatigues with these um, masks and um, balaclavas with state-of-the-art weaponry. And whensoever they're involved, generally, people die. And Joe Public sits there on the sidelines, great job, Gary, great job, Gary, mm. he's dealing a blow to crime. Each and every time, driving one more nail firmly into the coffin. Well, I, I agree because I have, um, I have a good friend. He, he lived in England for some time as well. So I guess his perspective would have been broader than, you know, a lot of people's own. And, and he always says, if that is how we think delimited is going to work, then eventually when you and a policeman have a, a personal falling out or... or the policeman, child mother, leave him, you know, child mother, leave him for you. They will come and set you up and shoot no, they, you. No, no, no. Not they, you know, he, that's not, that, that's not speculation. Mm. That happens. Right. No, that's exactly what happens. If someone in power wants what you want or doesn't want you to have it, what do you think happens to you? Yeah, so... I understand where it could really go. No, no, that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. That's where we are. And until or unless people take the opportunity to educate themselves and abate it, because you get to a stage where, because right now Trinidad's tither on the edge, where it will just descend yeah. into this, this base level, almost a state of anarchy. Because, think of it this way, I think what Joe Public isn't appreciating is if you dehumanise people, which they have done, and you just mentioned certain postcodes, and people are, oh, those savages. Do you think those so-called savages are going to lie down and play dead? Sooner or later, you'll get to a stage where you'll see the police coming, and you're not going to wait for them. Mm to execute you, to say, you know, your name's calling in this thing, and they come and drag you into some house, and then all of a sudden, on their report, you know, they, you let them in, and then all of a sudden, you pull out some AK-47, and they shoot you dead. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you must believe me when I tell you, that that um, has a foundation that's predominantly fact. So when you hear about things like that, as the neighborhood would, and I'm not talking about those cases where they say, oh, he was ever such a good mm. boy. And when you look, he has a rap mm. sheet, you know, thicker than um, the encyclopedia. When you have people who haven't been before the courts, their only crime in society's eyes 
is to live in one of these so-called hotspots or one of these um, alleged so-called ghettos, you know, with the underprivileged and deprived. From the moment you make those people easy targets, anyone, you make them easy targets, that you dehumanize them, that they no longer matter, that they don't, they're not entitled to civil liberties, they're not entitled to human liberties or human rights, that, you know, that they are fair game. What do you think happens? You're disenfranchising swathes of society. Whatever laws that you have, whatever practices or whatever procedures you have in place that a so-called civilized society is supposed to have, they fall out of that. So you can't complain when they don't play by the rules. When they see the police coming, they're not thinking these people are coming to save them. They're running because as far as they're concerned, these people are coming to kill them. And when these people are finding them and killing them, sooner or later they're going to stop running. And when they stop running, what do you think happens next? When you disenfranchise a certain section of society, huge swathes of society, you create a them and us. Right now you probably have about four sections of society. Hmm. You have those people who are deemed as the untouchables. These are the people who are subject to the extrajudicial um, killings. These are the people that Joe Public sit down and say that it's fair game to kill. Then you have Joe Public. That's supposed to be the average good citizen. After that, you have the so-called, if we call them, your politicians, your um, doctors, your lawyers, those types of people. And then you have this class of person who is supposed to be the one percent. They're not phased by what's taking place because they have the money and the wherewithal to put things in place to ensure that you can't get to them. They have their personal firearms, their personal, personal security, their gates to the community, they're living behind their fortresses. <clears throat> Politicians, generally protected. What section of society do you think the police service come from? Do you, but usually I think they come from the average. That's right, they're Joe yeah, Public. The average, yeah. They're Joe Public. But you see, right now, you have one section of society that's on the outside looking in. Joe Public, people for themselves, have classified themselves. They've done it for themselves. Mm -hmm. They have put these people, they, you know, they're from the ghetto. You know, they're not Trinis. They're subhuman. We're not like the 1%. So they're happy to worship them. Because guess what? These people, they have all the money, they have all the control. They have all the... So you know what? They're better than us and we will treat them better than us. The politicians and lawyers, they sit there with their mud slinging at them. Oh, they're all corrupt. Oh, they're crooks. They just run down money. So you have Joe Public and those people like your politicians and your business people, so and so forth, who are literally forming part, you know, that, that's literally society. The others actually don't fall into the realms of society because mm -hmm. they don't matter. They don't care how many... So, Joe Public, as long as you're killing the people in the ghetto, the police are doing their job. Yep, yeah, police are doing a good job. You know, they're killing those animals. You look at the criminal justice system. Who's in court? When was the last time you came to a court and sat down? Well, when they opened, that is. <laughs> <laughs> or while they were open. You sit down in there and you see who comes. You're pulling your magistrates from Joe Public. You know, if we lump Joe Public and we remove just the politicians and throw everyone else into Joe Public, you're taking your um, lawyers, making the magistrates, and they come from Joe Public. Do you think for one moment that when they come and sit on elevated onto the bench, that they're telling themselves that when the police bring these people before the court, that they're innocent. You don't think the police are sitting there thinking the exact same thing. If you didn't do something, the police wouldn't have arrested you. I sit down and I listen to some of the things that these people say, especially when you challenge the authority of the police. Thankfully, thankfully, you get some magistrates and some judges who see it for what it is. 
that they're objective enough to look at the law, apply it to the facts, and see exactly what is really going on. And they do it on a case-by-case -case basis. So they're not doing the generalization. Mm. They're not giving these chaps these types of bail, which is just bail on paper. It's no bail at all. Mm. Because a lot of ghettos in Trinidad, it tends to be squatted land, government land. Mm. So these people, if they're lucky if they've got a deed of comfort. So how are they really supposed to satisfy any bail conditions? And it's not as if, because I don't believe for one moment that every single person in or from a ghetto is a criminal. I don't ascribe to that. You know, I was born and raised in England. I know racism. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been subjected to it in various degrees. Implied, you know, just a print, but it's always there. And at some stage, it makes you question your sanity because it's just normalized. But you just know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And unless you prepare to play the role of Uncle Tom, you're always that square peg. So I love black people. And when I come to Trinidad, it breaks, it grieves me to see the things that I see taking but, place. But here we have more of a, a I, I would say, a classism in you. No, Trinidad's a classless society. Mm. Anyone who thinks that Trinidad, the only person that I've seen really in a public office, and I know it's a, it's a grave generalization, but um, was Manning. I thought that that man had class. I really did. And he really stood out. <laughs> he actually came across as really arrogant and you name it. But the man had class. Trinidad is a class. Trinidad is steeped in culture. It's not heritage. England's heritage. Mm. It's, uh, you know, it's classes, customs. And no amount of money in England can make you jump classes. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Yeah, Trinidad, no matter how much money someone has, you could go, <laughs> you go to Charlotte Street, you see the same behavior. <laughs> it's not about money. Money doesn't buy class. It has never bought class. Trinidad, as I say, it has culture, but it's losing it. As it starts to be sucked into the wake of this Americanism, this America, North American culture type endeavor, you can see they're losing it. They're just this Caribbean, laid back, easygoing, family oriented, community type. You can see it's going. You know, it's going, going, going. As people are now more and more looking down at their noses at who has and who doesn't have. Do you know, oh, look at my car, oh, look at my house, oh, look at my shoes, oh. And it wasn't like that before. But that's the way it's going. And until or unless, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago actually stop and take a good look at what's really happening. And to, to, because it's obvious who's letting them down. It really is obvious who is letting them down. But they just don't want to see that. They're so busy looking at the next new shiny thing, again, the American influence, that right in your backyard, you know, you're letting the monsters in mm. and you're just either refusing to see it or seeing it and just refusing to do anything about it. And the country's going to hell in a basket. Before um, we wrap up, just one more question I want to ask you, putting into the current pandemic situation. So today, uh, the Prime Minister brought back down the numbers to 10 people in public gatherings, right? Um, because of the, the new yeah. set of cases. Is a gathering home at your, at your private place considered a public gathering? No. So let's just say you have a, a quote unquote family line, as you're seeing just yeah. now with Trinidadians, you know. Um, yeah, you have a family line and it's have 10 or 20 or there in a family line, no admission to come in, you better be a barbecue in or whatever it may be. 
the application of the law. In England, the way they look at it is if you are a resident in the house, that doesn't infringe the law because you live there. Right. So you're a large family. But we're talking about a large family. We're talking about you invite. Mm -hmm. You're a large family and all told there may be 10, 15 of you there. You cannot argue that that's an infraction of the law. Right. Mm -hmm. When they use the term public, your residence is not a public place. But what you must understand is that in certain circumstances, the law looks at public in terms of access. If you can gain entry, um, again, you don't have to pay money to get in, that um, it is just a simple state where one can just present themselves and you know gain entry so that the public have access. That's where you may find yourself in difficulty. Oh. So yes, you may decide in your infinite wisdom you want to have your lion and it's only family that's coming. But when you look at interpretation of statue, you have the um, literal uh, mistress, mischief and golden rules. And those are just means of interpretation. Now, the golden rule really, or the mischief rather, is where they look at what is it that Parliament, the mischief, so to speak, that Parliament is trying oh. to stop. And in this instance, the mischief is to prevent more than 10 people coming together. So you may find yourself... Now, the thing about a lot of this legislation is that, yes, COVID has been here since... In Trinidad, that is, since, since March. March yeah. But that's really not enough time for the development of statute. Normally, statute goes through this process where it's on the books and then it's subject to amendments and then it's, you know, it's ratification. There might be more amendments. And so it goes through a whole process. You might look at the life of any particular parliament and they might bring in, especially if it's controversial, you know, it might take the life of that parliament literally to bring it in mm. as it's up and down, up and down. Now, a lot of legislation that they're bringing in in, under the COVID it's actually more type of like state of emergency stuff you know it's emergency types of endeavors and in those circumstances there's no presumption that it's going to be implemented for any great length of time and in those circumstances it's not subject to the scrutinies but it's to target a particular mischief so i would not encourage John Brown to have his family live in this current climate because he may find himself in difficulty. So, but okay, you know. But I've got to tell you, a lot of, remember, a lot of this, although you have a lot of people before the court for the breach of the COVID, I actually haven't done any trials yet. There have been no trials as it relates to it. There have been some people that have come and pleaded guilty, and um, those matters that I'm aware of. They've just uh, um, handed out fines to those people. But remember this, a fine for a breach of the COVID is a conviction. Trinidad does not have a Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. So you, until or unless you petition for a presidential pardon, and I won't trouble you with that, it suffice to say, you have a stain on your character for life. It is a criminal, conviction. So you gathering at Uncle Joe because it's his birthday potentially will be criminalized. And going back to the point that I made earlier, you now become part of Joe's public criminal element because you have a criminal record. Wow. Wow. No, so in a case like that, let's just say everybody's inside of a house and the police find out some new neighbor call and neighbor say, there are more than 10 people there. No, police will storm in there, raid the place. But on the, would they have legal 
rates the storm in? Or? At some stage, they will either produce a warrant or argue that they had reasonable suspicion that some criminal activity was taking place. <clears throat> I've just finished telling you that a COVID conviction is a criminal mm -hmm. conviction. So if there's more than 10 of you gathered there, is that not a criminal activity? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Is that not giving the police reasonable grounds mm -hmm. for then storming the place mm -hmm. and dragging people out mm -hmm. shackled? So you can argue that you're living there. Okay. When you produce your driver's permit, will it have that address on it? Are you not then gather, gathering? The question really is, can you argue legitimately that it's a public venue, a public place? Right. Which is where people would have to go. Those people who were recently arrested down in um, Sauer, that place wasn't functioning as in open at that time. It was closed. Right. So it was a private endeavour. They're all before the court. I told you that I have not, we haven't done any trials yet. I'm not aware of any of my colleagues that have done trials in this. So we're yet to see how the state really going to cheat will treat with these matters and indeed what the court's approach will be. So in the meantime, just do a chance it. My advice to you is, as I've told you, there's certain sections of society that the police leave to do whatever they want to do and everyone else is subject to the law. So, ask yourself, you feel like being a criminal today? <laughs> Yeah, but before we um we close, you know, just as we hear any cars and then passing, so let me talk to you a bit about cars. I know he started off pretty good when um when he started investing in vehicles here. Yeah. Um, he had a Honda RS RSX. Yeah, that's what you call it. That's the um the, the Integra. The, yeah, the Integra DC5. Yeah. Lovely car. You had it. before that. I had the um, small lights um. Honda Civic. Right. Yep, yeah, with my, what was it, the um, spoon this and um, the VTEC controller mm. and yeah. Right. Yeah, done with that, yeah. And then um, you went to, you had a S15. Yeah, S15. Yeah. And then somehow you end up running off the track. I don't know what went on here. Why, you know? I mean, I is, know it, where you're going. You, uh, is it that you were homesick? You, you were missing home, so you needed to, to get something from across on that side. I don't know, talk to me. My brother, well, one of my brothers, he's like me, a real petrol head. And he had a, um, was it a Lotus, a Lotus Mercedes. That's before McLaren was involved mm. in them. And that was a lovely car, really was a lovely car. And when I was in England, before I came here, I owned a, um, <clears throat> A three two three, I think it was, or three no three two five, BMW and a Golf GTI. Um, those were the two cars I owned at that time. And when I came to Trinidad, I looked. I took a practical approach. I noticed that everyone was driving Japanese cars which wasn't really the norm. Although, when I was in England, I owned, um, I don't know what you call them here, but they were CRXs, right. the Honda, mm -hmm. two and a half seats or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they used to, you know, now the reason I owned one of those is because they used to have that, they were racing those in England. Um, there was a championship. Those cars, yeah. lovely cars they were, really nice cars. So that was, that was that. So I, I didn't really have a problem with Honda. Never really a Toyota man. But, Looking at what everyone was driving, the availability, the availability, availability of parts, and the fact that I do like to drive, it made sense to go Japanese. But then, I think that I... I went European because I know European. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. I, okay. And they give you better ride, unless you go to the high-end Japanese cars, um, Lexus, 
Um, even Toyota, even Toyota, Toyota give you wonderful rides as well. Yeah, but who wants to drive a hair dryer? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, if you're going to go Japanese, it's got to be Honda. Mm. Yeah, everybody knows that. No, 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 Toyota, but okay. No, no, okay, no, okay. No, 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 no Karen, please. <laughs> please. Okay, you're on camera. Okay. So unless you're going to edit edit this bit out, mm. don't 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 say things like that. Okay. Okay, Honda. Think Honda. But I don't know what it'll be so now though, because Toyota right now, um, given you the most Honda power, already two JZ, your ride in Toyota right now is unbeatable in coming out of Japan. Um, so no. I don't know what you'll be sent on for, for. No, 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 no. You, oh. you have to drive. You see, the thing about Honda, it's Honda acknowledge that there is um, Grandma Agnes. That likes driving Honda. Mm. So you have to give Granny something that she's comfortable in and something that you know she's happy to drive. And because they know that, they give you that reliability, that smooth ride, they give you the efficiency, they give you everything that you could possibly want at a fair price. But they know there are those people out there that deserve more. So they give you these aftermarket parts. <laughs> Readily available, mm. easily accessible, simply installed, and then you can turn that Honda into a proper driving machine. Because I'll tell anyone, when I used to drive that Honda, the car in front is me. <laughs> <laughs> but then you're good. Let me remember it like this. No, you say I don't believe in statistics, so I, I do want to say this part. Then don't say it. Right? No, no, don't no. Say it. So, but, but okay. Even if the statistics are skewed, Toyota was the number one or the most reliable car in the world for eight or nine years running, right? And the thing is with Toyota, let me, let me tell you about Toyota. As you say, Honda, they give you this nice, reliable car, whatnot. And if you need more, they have these parts available. With Toyota, all you need to do is just mash a little more. That's it. That's all. You just need to press a little further down, and that's it. You forget, <laughs> when I bought that Honda, I was in chambers, myself and Paul Cham, and he, real petrol head, real petrol head, he bought the Celica. Mm. He used to have a black Celica. And he went and bought, oh geez, I can't remember the aftermarket ignition system that he bought. But I just put the Hondata on mine. And that was it. Mm. That's the only, so he had his, the, was it the Apexi? Mm, he right did that. And I did the Honda, and I went to saw my little friend Kess, and he put it on the rolling road, he tuned it up. Full chance went to his little buddies, went on his little rolling road, put things up, put his up. I slaughtered that man every time. Every time. Both of them were 1800s. But th that's which one? That's the. Um... Well, mine's a two litre. I accept, but <laughs> <laughs> at that stage, it was so, the engine. So the RSX is the no? It was the engine that gave you the, it, remember it broke the record in terms of the amount, it gave you, was it one horsepower for each cc? Mm -hmm. So it was giving you 200 at the flywheel and it was a two liter. Um, I would admit that that engine, which is the K20, yes. the, K, the K20 is Honda's biggest accomplishment. Don't get me wrong, the B, B16 and the B18, they were good. They were good. But the K20, Exceptional. Definitely one of Exceptional. the biggest accomplishments. Yeah. Right? In keeping with Honda, I might mm -hmm. add. <laughs> but, did, yeah, um, in Not terms of Toyota, yeah, Toyota, Toyota does not have a two litre, they don't have a two litre engine that would compare with that in terms of power. It would be the 3S, which. And won't. that's the end of the conversation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> What more can you say? Well, I guess in baby power, yeah. In baby power, yes. No, no, you see, I remember <laughs> when I was um, working on that Honda, the return on my investment was a phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, because you didn't have to bore out anything, you didn't have to skim anything. All we did was port the inlet to the um, head, mm. putting the manifold a little gasket to cool down the temperature and streamline the exhaust now was, you could not improve on the exhaust manifold what do you look called the downdraft what do you call the manifold the exhaust the, manifold? the extractor extractor you couldn't improve on that 
I remember doing all the research. It transpired all the aftermarket ones gave you less performance than the one it came out of the factory with. But what they did say was that you could use a slightly bigger bore, you had to take out a catalytic converter and smooth out some of the curves and you were laughing all day long. The rest of it was just simple suspension work. You couldn't upgrade the brakes because you couldn't get bigger brakes. Mm -hmm. And that, oh yeah, you had to change all the um, bushings to the... Um, polyurethane. Yeah, polyurethane. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'd have to put the engine, that little shock thing on it, the shock thing. Yeah, the breeze. Yeah, the yeah. breeze. That car, with the launch control, the progressive limited slip diff, those six forward gears so closely matched, <laughs> that, it was as if, when you got into that car, it's as if you put it on. Yeah, it's as if you put it in. I, as, listen, I, I would concede defeat in this, be, because of that one car. That Integra is the only car, in my opinion. Would you say it was the exception? Right? Would um, you say it was the exception? Yeah. And you know what they say, don't you? It's the exception that makes the rule. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Will, Thanks for spending this time with us. Uh, feel free to leave your contact information, your social media if you need to. Okay. Um, you can reach me. People normally reach me directly on my mobile. Um, in fact, I'll give you the office number. 625-2442. Always find me at Duke Street, opposite the Blind Welfare. Nice. Pleasure. Take Thanks care. again. All right. Mm -hmm.